Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. My name is Arlene Sachs. This is Sally Ann Sachs. And today we uh, want to welcome Carol Witten. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. Uh, Carol's going to talk to us about something that we might not think of when we're first beginning genealogy, but is terribly important, and that's how to read these very, very old documents where the handwriting is so terribly different from what we have. How did you get into this? Well, I started when I was about 10 helping my mother rep repair a family tree that my grandmother had made. And I got interested in high school in taking German because I asked questions and my family was all German ancestry. And my grandmother had saved from the World War I book burning some German books that were written in the German Gothic script. And I needed to learn to read the German Gothic uh, script. And, and from there you've expanded into this. So what are your general, generally, how do you approach reading old documents? I would first advise people to study recent handwriting. Um, anything that you've written, that your spouse has written, um, your friends, particularly anything that was written in a hurry, such as when you were taking notes in a high, high school or college lecture, um, because you'll get practice at reading other people's writing is good basis for starting. Then I would say read as many examples of the document that you're interested, the kind of document that you're interested in, as you possibly can find. Um, if you're interested in wills, just read a lot of wills so that you learn the legal phraseology that mm -hmm. will be in those documents. And try to read full transcripts. Don't just go to a book of abstracts because what they've abstracted is just the names, the dates, and the places, and they don't give you any of the legal phraseology. Once you've learned that every document has a typical organization and typical stock phrases in it, then when you need a document that is blurry or faded or uh, has bleed through from the back side of the page, you'll know what those legal phrases are supposed to say, and it'll be easier for you to read and figure out what they are. And you'll also know, if you're looking at a bunch that are similar, you'll know approximately where the name occurs. That's and right. And that's one of the first things I always found. I had a, you know, I yeah. know in the middle they of the page. They always have a stock organization, yeah, a typical organization. Right, and, and your mind fills in. You know, that, that's why some people who are fast readers are very terrible proofreaders, because you fill in what isn't, quite there. What isn't there, that's right. Mm -hmm. And once you've learned the stock phrases, then I would advise you to start backwards in time. Start with the most recent because that'll be the closest to the modern handwriting. Right. And then work backwards towards the old documents which are harder to read. Um, and take time, don't read too fast. Take time to understand everything that the document says. And practice, that's, that's probably the key word. Practice both reading and writing because if you practice writing in the style that they used and making those letters, and I would get yourself a piece of second or third grade paper and try and use that paper to make the letters so that you know how the letters were formed. Then when you run across a word that's difficult, you can trace the letters and, and maybe discover what letter it is. Oh, how clever. Did you teach yourself all these chips? Um, I, I took some lectures and I also um, uh, practiced myself. Yes, it's, it's really not very hard if you practice. Practice is the key thing. And of course, puts, if you find something that really is too difficult, put it aside and wait because later as you progress and you gain experience, you will learn more and you'll be surprised what you couldn't read at first that yes. you can read later. Did you find you had to do like one letter at a time and refer to a table and... In look? English, no. Um, because once I learned to read some of the documents, I could anticipate what the stock phrases were going to say because they say the same thing yeah. over and over and over again. But now I have a question. So are, are spelling and capitalization and punctuation, all these things, you seem to be implying that they're not the same anymore. No, they're not. Um, there weren't any specific rules at the time. What time are we talking about? Um, 19th century, 18th okay. century, so and back. So as recent as, as the 19th century? As recent as the middle of the 19th century, anyway. In um, what countries are we talking? Um, the United States to start with, and then as you go back, you'll have other countries involved. Okay. Um, spelling was often phonetic, and things could be spelled differently in the same document. Uh -huh. So you won't find any spelling synchronization. Um, capitalization 
was often used for stress. For example, in the document that you see on the screen now, I've underlined there a number of words that are not proper nouns and are not the beginning words of the sentence, but yet they are capitalized. They're uh -huh. capitalized for stress. That's the way people do it in their emails these days. Okay. And of course, there's no punctuation whatsoever in a lot of these oh, documents. Really? Yes. So it's as if the whole document, whether it's two sentences or five pages, is one long sentence. Well, do you know the beginning of a sentence because the first word is capitalized or not necessarily? Sometimes. Um, not always. In the, in the document that we were just showing on the screen, the beginning of the sentence was capitalized, but because all the other words are capitalized, it's sometimes hard to tell where the beginning of the sentence is. Uh, sometimes there are paragraphs, sometimes there are not. Mm. Okay. When did it, so all this started standardizing in the late 19th century? In the late 19th century, basically. What about numbers? Numbers, well, numbers can also be different. Um, for example, on the screen now we have two examples at the top where you see a, let, a number that is sort of sideways. Yes. That number looks like a sideways S. Well, yes. yeah. it's really an 8. So the first number is 1820 and the second is 1687 88. A split year. Oh my hmm. goodness, I would never have guessed that, that that year from. <laughs> and down at the bottom, that number, that is a five. Now, you can't really tell that that's a five. It, it kind of has a squirrel at the end to make it look like a five and a three combined. Yes. And the best way to figure out that that is a five is to look at other examples of the yes. man's handwriting on the same page or adjacent pages. But also from this, even just in this small example, you could see that the man puts a little squirrel at the end of his S and his B and his G and all the other letters. So it's not surprising that he puts that little curl on the bottom of the five. Okay. So he just wants to make it a little And prettier. abbreviations? Oh, and abbreviations are very, very common because if you're, I mean, think about it. If you're a clerk who sits there and writes the same thing over and over and over all day long, you get tired of writing those words out, so you abbreviate them. Um, here we've got some of the most common ones, senior, deceased, um, aforesaid, said is another one that's commonly abbreviated, and C for and etc. And a commissioner, administrator, Executive. I would think it would vary from language to language. This I, is I English, didn't realize right? that English had that Germany in German today. Well, they Come still do, do tons of all about them. Jewish headstones in cemeteries. There's books written on what these abbreviations mean. Yeah, well, it goes back I, centuries. I just didn't realize it was in English. <laughs> everybody, <laughs> everybody abbreviates. Yes, <laughs> when they write, particularly when they write a lot. Sure. Uh, well, and that's you do what these college note taking. Exactly. Yeah. Uh huh. And, and so, so then words divided, what about that? When, you, did well, they, when you're going to divide a word, surprisingly, it's the same in foreign languages as it is in English. They used either a colon or a dash or a double dash after the end of the word. Now, for example, on this line, the, the first uh, example, where is on the first line, and there's a double dash, and then at the beginning of the next line, there's a single dash and the of. That's all one word, whereof. The same is true down the second line down. Apart is AP, double dash, and then there's a single dash and ART on the next were, line. they let you know they had split it. Yes. Well, now, but, but they yes. didn't do it consistently because okay. here in the same document on the third example, you see BEN, single dash, and nothing on the next line for EDICT. But the name is Benedict. It is mm. a divided word. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I've seen sometimes documents where they just stop where they get to the end it, with, without it being syllables that we think of as dividing words into d syllables or something. They'll exactly. Just, design, divide it just, just wherever. anywhere, yes. wherever they want. And they might get tired of writing the ending of the word, so they just put this big squirrel at the end of the well, line. <laughs> men, I think, do this more than women. When you sign your name, we still, most women I've watched, Sign their name with all the letters. Have you ever watched the man sign his signature? It's, 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 it's maybe the most <laughs> sim letters visible or something like that. But what about the formation of letters? Did that change too? Oh, that the definitely changed. Um, here, here's an example of the old English alphabet. And on the first arrow, you see a C that looks like a small C. And it looks like an R. It looks like our printed R today. It's very unusual. The next arrow down, you see an E 
but it's a cursive E and it looks like it's backwards. It is backwards. Oh my, then the <laughs> teachers wouldn't talk about dyslexia. <laughs> Um, How interesting that is. Then you see an example in the third arrow there of a capital H. That H in the middle there yes. is very difficult for people to figure out that it's an H. The, th the third H there, the third capital H in that sample, sort of looks like an H with a large hook below the line. Yes. Um, but the one in the middle is really tough for people to figure out sometimes. That's why you really need to have a table like that to, yes, to, to, and, this, need, and you need to obtain a copy of the alphabet and take it with you so that when you're reading the document, you can refer to it. And probably the best advice is to get a copy that shows more than one way to form Yes, that's the letters. what I was going to ask. Was the 19th century different from the 18th century? And did the, the letters change? I mean, the, the It evolved. I guess that's, that's what the I best way to happen. say. It, it yes. evolved over time how the letters were made. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest difficulty, I guess, is um, I and J and U and V. Um, I and J looked almost identical, yes. and U and V looked almost identical. But weren't weren't so they almost u in used interchangeably? They were used interchangeably, and very often in an alphabetical list, you will only see one, one of those appear. Mm. All the I's and J's are on one page, and all the U's and V's oh, are on another page. Uh, the biggest problem, I guess, in alphabet is the double S, which looks like a small F yeah. yes. in our cursive handwriting The double today. S only, th we didn't use that in English, did we? Yes, we did. Oh, well, I thought it was only well, German. No, you look at the, doc even the Declaration of Independence has some, some letters oh. like that. There, there, for example, on the screen now is, is the word commissioners. C-O-M-M-I-S-S. -S, and it looks like an F, yes. but it's not an F. It's, it's a, an S, and there's another S after it. Now, it, it and down at the bottom, the second word is assist, A-S-S-I-S-T. And those are 19th century documents? Those are 18th century documents. Okay. Uh, well, no, those are 19th century documents. Yes, they are 19th century. In, in, Germany, they some, in German, they sometimes use just the, what looks like to us like an F, but the loop is the other side for the S. Right, yes. It, it looks like an F, and it goes backwards. And okay, but that fell that's out. a double S in English. Yeah. But in German, it's, it's not. It's an H. And we'll get to that oh, in a minute. Oh, go on. <laughs> okay. Um, the other example would be the, the two Fs together. Yes. It's not two Fs. It's one F. Uh, in this document, for example, the man's name is Farish. F-A-I-R-I-S-H. It looks like two Fs, or even looks like a capital H sometimes, uh, if you're not yes. careful when you look at it. Um, but it is a single F. So, and there are several other things that you might want to notice in that document. Between the first words, it, the first two words are Robert and Jeremiah Witten. Uh, the and sign between the two words yes. is an and with a big hook on the bottom of it. Yes. And then the Jeremiah has those backwards E's in it. J E R E. Uh -huh. Those are backwards from from the original uh, document. Uh, orphans. The word orphans. There mm -hmm. on the top line has right. a colon after it to indicate that it's shortened, that they've abbreviated the word. Oh, a colon was used. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then down on the bottom line, you see art and mystery of a carpenter. Uh, art and mystery. It's all capitalized, yeah. first of all. Uh, yeah. yeah. Last mystery is spelled M-I-S-T-E-R-Y, and carpenter is spelled C-A-R-P-E-N-D-E-R. Oh, interesting. Yes. The D and the T. Sure. There, there's lists of, of letters that are interchangeable, like B's and V's and, and I think that D's and T's. The, the, the in all the languages, there's something called dentals and other things where, the, where it's, uh, the, they interchange with yes. each other. Yes, if you do linguistics, that's mm -hmm. the case. Mm -hmm. um, now, are, you, are your techniques more or less the same for reading in other languages as they are for English? Um, well, for English, for example, for an English document, you would start by finding the known words the names, the dates, and the places. And then you would look for repeated letters or words. Um, actually, it's best to step back. Look at the whole document first to start with. Find the known words, find the repeated words, figure out what they are. That'll help you know what kind of a document it is. Um, then read it aloud for context. And finally, transcribe the whole document so you don't forget. And uh, the next example that I had was one where there was an insert, a carrot, and something had been written in. 
Um, if that's hard to read, you'll be able to read it more because you've because you've read a lot of road orders. When you find out that this is a road order, you've read a it's lot a of road them. order. Um, the people were appointed to fix the road, maintain the road in their neighborhood. So they would appoint a person to be the surveyor and then another person to allot the hands. What's allot the hands? Uh, me <laughs> meaning uh, figuring out who lives on this road and who should be. This is in the United States. Yes, who should be no, providing. We don't really that either. And listen, we don't normally do early American. Yeah. So, so we haven't. This is all new. That's, uh, that's how roads were built. There was no road commission. Uh, okay. The road commission was the people who lived along the road, and it was their job to maintain the road. A lot the hands, hands meaning bodies. Meaning, yeah, the meaning of the people who would work. And now, in some cases, if you were far enough south and you had, they had slaves, they would allot some of their slaves. But in other cases, if it was just individual people living along the road, they would allot the people on the road to actually be the workers on this road. Oh, how fascinating. And, and these documents and they're called them. road orders. Where yes. do you find these? That's another source. You find them in order books, the county court order books. So and how far back are we going? Uh, how we, how close to modern times will you find? What are the latest mm. ones you might have found? I've seen them into the into the late eighteen hundreds at least. Really, interesting. Probably that's in smaller that's places by in then. Probably in smaller places by then. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. Um, okay. So you're so, but for foreign languages, I would say that there are some things that you would do a little differently. You would at first obtain a foreign word list. Uh, you could do that by getting on the LDS website because they have a list of them and you can print them off from there. Or you can go to your family hist local family history center and... You mean for birth, death, marriage? Uh, right. They would give you word lists for the commonly used genealogy words. Mm -hmm. It would be like a dictionary. Now, for other foreign languages like this one, for example, this is Thode's German English Dictionary. No, hold uh -huh. absolutely fine. So it doesn't. Oh, sh you want to hold it which way? Oh, hold it okay. Hold it, okay. hold it so it doesn't like that. So it right. Fine. Oh, okay. And it's easier to find the genealogical terms, particularly the terms like occupations and medical terms that were used in the old times. If you use a specific genealogical dictionary as opposed to just That's a modern ordinary. German English dictionary. Very clever. Okay. They exist for things other than German? Oh, yes, they do. I'm sure they do. Okay. Um, Another thing I found helpful for me is I have an 1885 English-German dictionary. And that had a lot of the words that you won't find in right. a modern dictionary. Right. I don't know whether he has it in, uh, in, in that. He does in some cases, but not in all cases. I mean, there are still words that you won't find that, right. in, that are in the document that you won't find in right. his dictionary. Um, the next thing you would want to do is practice writing the surname in the old script because you're going to have to recognize that surname when you get the documents or when you get the microfilm or whatever is it is. A good way to do so it. writing is the best way to recognize that how that surname is going did to you, be formed. Did you stumble on that for yourself or was this the trick that people who Oh no, this is a trick that people pass along. Oh, okay. okay. Um, the other thing you might want to write learn to write words like birth, death, marriage, birth, things that you know are going to be in the documents that you're looking at. Because the practice of writing the letters will make you, uh, it'll make it clearer to you, when you when make it easier for you to recognize and the letters. It, it's, it's as if you're digging grooves it's in your another, brain somewhere. Yes. It's another input to your, yeah, you know, sure. like some people are verbal, some are right, visual. Yeah, right. But then just like in English documents, the documents are all in a stock order. You need to learn what the order is. If a death certificate is always written with the date and then the name of the deceased and then the identifier, which would be like for a man, the identifier might be his occupation. Right. For a woman, it might be her maiden name right. or her husband's name. Uh, for a child, it might be the name of the father. Right. Um, and then the date of death and then the age at death and then Clever. the... Um, you know, so the documents are always in a particular order and they have stock phrases. So if you make a list of those stock phrases and take that list along with you with translations, you won't spend time worrying about the stock phrases in the document. Yes. You, you will already know what they say. Very. What about the, what, what, what do you think is the most difficult letter or letters in German? Um, probably for the English speaker, the most difficult two letters 
are the H, the small H, which looks just like that S that we saw in English. And also the N and the N and the N and the U and the oh. E. They're upside the, the they're N upside and the down. U are written exactly the same way except that the U has to have a, a U bogan over the top of it. Now, of course, a person who's handwriting a letter, a word that has a U in the middle of it, What's he's going to... bogan? It's a little swirl. Oh, a little okay. Oh, okay. concave circle. Oh, of. one of those accent marks. It's but not, not a, quite an accent. It's not, a U, uh, not an umlaut. The umlauted right. letters in German are two dots. That's right. But it's a little swirl. But even in modern German, the M looks like the W but and the I w have a story like I this. must tell you. It, it, in Washington, we had a man in our genealogy society whose name was Y-E-N-T-I-S. Mm -hmm. And he knew that his parents should be in the 1910 New York census. He never could find them. He was a volunteer at the National Archives, and one day he <laughs> hit the side of his head, and he coded out Y-E-U-T-I-S, and there they were. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and he'd been looking for years. For the N's and the U's look exactly alike, and the E, which is supposed to be an up-down stroke, and then you pick up your pen and start at the top and go down-up, is actually, in handwriting, looks very much like the N and the U because the people connect those two right. middle parts together. So those are the most difficult letters. I found letters. the A very hard also, personally, in, in the, reading the German. The capital A is made so many different ways. The capital B is very hard. In fact, all the capital the letters. Capital, yeah, but even the small A, which to me looks like a VI or something. But, when, when, you know, but what I'm thinking is, well, now that Ancestry has put all the censuses on the web, I hope they've done it accurately, because handwritten census enumerator, hand, you know, they were handwriting. So that David and Daniel can be mistaken. And that's exactly right. David and Daniel are often mistaken in English documents. Yes. Um, and so if, if somebody has put something in a, a printed index, like the Ellis Island Index, where Riga shows up as Piga. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's... And that's true of all the websites. Anything that's transcribed could have that kind of problem, because it's dependent upon the person who did the transcribing. Right. Um, and that's why your advice to start with the most recent and go backwards is yeah. really a good one. The uh, other thing is to photocopy the document and, oh, of course. and then scan it into your computer and then you can use, you can not only enlarge it, which I've done on all these examples that I've shown, but you can also uh, bring out faded items. So for example on this next slide there's a line there in the middle that appears to be blank. Yes. It's not blank. That's the most important information in that document. That's the place of birth oh my. of the person. Birth. And in order to look anything up in, in Germany, and, and in most Euro, 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 Euro countries, you need to know no. the name of the village. And so what I told this person to do, who, um, Rick Sayer, who gave me this document, was to try and enhance that document. We're using the photo techniques on his computer. And he put in more red, which brought out the ink color a little bit. Um, changed the brightness and the contrast a little bit, and then enlarged it even more. Um, eventually, we were able to read Hessen Darmstadt as the wow. state, but that's, that's not going to help. Big, yeah. He has to have the village name. The village name is in front of it. So when he took that document and enlarged that, he took it over to one of the family history centers, and she was able to read GEN at the end of that word and use a reverse alphabetical index for hessen Darmstadt for all the villages that ended in G-E-N, and they decided that there was a B at the beginning, and they could see some of the slanted up letters and letters below the line, so they had an idea of what the, le the word looked like. They used the reverse al alphabetical index, and they came up with Bedigan in hessen Darmstadt, which turned out when he ordered the films to be the correct wow. place. Wow, that's, that's, that's You really know, we only have a, a, a short time, and I know you have a large list of references that you want us to be sure to, to get okay. to. Um, the references that I would recommend for English handwriting is this one by Kent Bailey and Ransom True, which is Guide to 17th Century Cent Virginia Court Handwriting. Or this other one um, by Kip Sperry, which is Reading Early American Handwriting. Mm -hmm. Those are probably the two most used early American handwriting documents. There are a number of websites. Uh, uh, rather than read the websites out, because you do have a lot, I don't think anybody listening can write them down that fast. I'm just going to say tracingroots.nova.org, which is our website, 
And anybody that's interested, if they go to there, we'll provide links to all of those others, because you have Good. quite, a, quite a number of them listed there. Actually, I only listed a very small selection <laughs> of all of the ones that are out still, there. still, it's too much to... to you know, it's interesting. Right. Listening, it, it, it occur, okay. And then for the German handwriting, I would recommend these two books, uh, Edna Bentz and Roger Minert. And they both have some... French and some Latin vocabulary as well, because you will run into French and Latin in German documents as well Absolutely, as German. Yes. Um, well, so the, the Western Germany went back and forth between well, France you know, and, and our genealogy society has a large list of Hungarian words, which are very, mm -hmm. I never found, but one of our members made it up for us, which is very The, um, the LBS website does maintain word lists in the guides section, under ah. the guides section. If so you any click place, on, any country where they film, or any, if they have Poland, if they have this. Right, they maintain I, a word list. And most family history centers also have those available for a nominal fee, like 50 cents or a dollar. That's very important. Do you want to show that last one? Uh, under this, is, this is just a handwriting, a German handwriting book. And I'm not sure whether it's still available or not. Uh, it's written by the Germans, but it's essentially like a primer for a grade school yes. oh. where you can learn to make the letters wonderful and practice the letters and that that really is my one thing that i want everybody to go away from this lecture with <laughs> is practice. practice practice writing as well as reading because practice will improve your skills thank you so very much carol it's been really informative to have you because you touched on a lot of things we haven't really talked about and it's very interesting thank you very much yeah thank you necessary really it's nice